John Hechen Heckinger, a senior editor at Bloomberg News, was the 2011 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Public Service and a two-time winner of the George Polk Award for his reporting on education. Before joining Bloomberg in 2010, he was a senior special writer at the Wall Street Journal, where he focused on education and finance. A graduate of Yale University, he lives near Boston with his wife and daughter. Please join me in welcoming John Heckinger. Thank you very much. Um, great. Okay. First of all, thank you so much, John, for coming. This is to have a Pulitzer Prize finalist here is pretty amazing. So, yeah, I was talking to John just before, and it's clear that you're an extremely intelligent, thoughtful person, and it's making me insecure about my half-baked questions. Um, but the full title of your book is True Gentlemen, The Broken Pledge of America's Fraternities. We're going to begin by talking a little bit about uh, the origins of the book briefly. And then we're going to spend probably the bulk of this conversation uh, just going through the actual arguments of the book. Um, and then uh, in the maybe last third of the conversation, I'm going to put forward several cr critiques uh, that are based on some of my own thoughts and based on conversations I've had with numerous fraternity alums and supporters of fraternities. So. Um, so going to the first of those, origins and history, and these I'm just going to read out. Um, so uh, could you begin by telling us how you got interested in fraternities uh, and why you chose to call the book True Gentleman? So this, this book grew out of a series of articles that I wrote for Bloomberg News uh, with a colleague, and it was a sort of an investigation of deaths of fraternities. We looked at, we kind of tallied up all the deaths for almost a decade and found 60 of them. And we wanted to ask some questions about sort of why these were happening, who's responsible, who should be held liable, what can be done about them. And throughout the, throughout the year, we ended up sort of focusing again and again on, on a single fraternity, which was Sigma Alpha Epsilon, which had more deaths than any other fraternity, 10 in the period that we were looking at. And um, so after the series ran, sort of an extraordinary thing happened. The fraternity itself, the leadership, sort of embraced that last story and kind of brought it to the membership. And it turned out that although they didn't talk to us during the investigative piece, they were, if anything, more alarmed about the behavior of the fraternity than sort of anyone that I had ever seen. I mean, they were worried that the fraternity would be shut down. You know, it was founded in the 19th century and they were afraid that this was the end, that the insurance companies the insurance uh, company would, would cut them off and they would just completely go out of existence. And also they were really upset. You had this, the guy who had devoted himself his whole life to the fraternity and was afraid to have his own son join. And um, so he, um, he kind of took this to heart. He's also, he got these calls in the middle of the night of, you know, um, several times a year of uh, finding out that he had to go call someone's parents that their kid had died because of uh, uh, drinking or hazing. And so he kind of, he and his uh, Supreme Council, which is kind of like the board of the fraternity, started, uh, started trying to, re instituting a series of reforms that we can talk about a bit later. And from that, I, I thought that it would be a fascinating book to see SAE as kind of a, a character of, a, of, a, of, of an organization under siege that represented many of the worst things about fraternities, um, but also was really trying to change. And, and that's kind of the question that I wanted to ask. And I, I called it True Gentleman because True Gentleman is the, uh, is the creed of, of SAE. And um, I'm sure many of you are in fraternities and you, you have your creeds or your sayings, but you know, it kind of boils down to the golden rule. And uh, I think the ending is something, a man with whom um, honor is sacred and virtue is safe. And I did find that there were many people who really felt these words deeply and kind of lived by them, but they, they, were, they understood that they weren't really living up to these words. And so the book is kind of structured, looking at each part of the creed and kind of evaluating SAE based on that and kind of telling stories about where they, where they didn't measure up and sort of where the future would hold. Supreme Council, that's a funny That's thing. right, they have sound, great. It sounds like an Iranian. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could tell us uh, just a few things regarding the history of fraternities background. So uh, the questions I hear, how did fraternities get started? Why were they started? Uh, how have they changed over time? And how has their popularity 
changed over time and why? Well, that was one of the things I found most fascinating in, in researching this is that, um, you know, fraternities are much more central to higher education than I ever understood. I think a lot of people feel that, you know, maybe it's kind of a subculture or, you know, there are certain people who belong. But what I found is that if you go back really to the 18th century, the, the, first, the first fraternity was, um, was Phi Beta Kappa, uh, founded in 1776, and it was a, a literary society. And um, over time, it changed to the sort of premier scholarly organization in, in the country. Um, it's no longer a social fraternity. But what I saw was from the, that fraternity and also from the sort of social fraternities that were founded in the, in the 1820s, that they were re sort of rebelling against a kind of higher education that focused on training people for the clergy and studying Latin and Greek. And that, you know, these were men, because at this point men were the only ones going to college, who wanted more out of college. They wanted to become leaders. They wanted to study, you know, modern subjects like American literature and poetry. And they were, so they were from the very beginning, they were kind of rebelling against the sort of authority of the administration. And the rebellion could be intellectual. At times it was also a rebellion against the sort of restraints on behavior. So there were... Uh, drinking was a problem from the very beginning. Um, there were riots. There were, you know, episodes of like professors being pelted by rocks. So you had from the very beginning kind of a split personality, kind of these, this desire to be kind of uh, reformers and leaders on campus, but also this, this kind of behavior that was extremely alarming. Um, th you know, um, dr again, drinking, violence even. And um, when women came onto campus, you know, misogyny and, and a lack of, sort of lack of respect. And so I think, in a way, if you think about the kinds of problems that fraternities face today, they're kind of in the DNA. And the question I, I kind of wanted to ask is, you know, could these two strands be, be disentangled? And I, what was the, la the last part, I think, was sort of how they've changed. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's also interesting. So the, the, what's interesting is that fraternities are now as popular as they've ever been. There are about 400,000 members of fraternities. It's a 50% increase from a decade ago. But they were about to kind of go out of business in the 1960s and 70s during the time of the, the counterculture. Um, I mean, there was serious talk about whether there was any future for, for sort of organizations that were sort of inherently traditional and nostalgic um, establishment, I guess was the other term that was used. And there was a big change starting in the 1980s for two two main reasons. One was, strangely enough, the movie Animal House, <laughs> which came out in 1978. And I remember seeing it, and, and, and it, it seemed to be like a, a satire of fraternity life, but it was read very differently. A lot of people saw it as kind of a manual for what college should be like. <laughs> and so people kind of took that, and, and art imitated life, and, or life imitated art, actually. Yeah. At the same time, in the 80s is when um, um, President Reagan decided to kind of change the, the drinking laws and raised, raised the drinking age from, from 18 to 21. And this made a huge difference. Um, it was much harder for colleges to host you know, keg parties, for instance. I remember actually, I, I was in college right during that transition. The first couple of years, there was you know, kegs in like you know, the official parties, then that was no longer. And fraternities kind of stepped into the void and became the sort of social spaces, the, the, the underage bartenders, as I like to think of them, for college campuses. And a lot of colleges kind of look the other way, as they still do today. And it gave fraternities a lot of social capital, but also created a huge number of problems. Problems that um, I, I looked at sort of internal fraternity documents from that period. You know, the, 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 the nationals, again, were really, really alarmed because the drinking was so out of control, and in fact, it was so out of control that only a handful of insurance companies would even write policies. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the 1980s, the insurance industry rated fraternities just above toxic waste dumps in terms of <laughs> their risk. And this was another sort of existential crisis for fraternities. So what fraternities did is they changed these policies so that they protected themselves the national organizations, so that when you all join a fraternity, you'll pay like several hundred dollars 
a year or less if you're a very safe fraternity for liability insurance. But if anything actually goes wrong in one of your chapter houses, you're on your own. It doesn't cover, it doesn't cover anything related to drinking or hazing or sexual assault, which is really the main issue that you know, you're likely to be covered for. They'll hire lawyers, you'll be kind of on your own, they'll go after your parents and the homeowner's insurance. And that's kind of where we are today, where um, I, I, I like to stress that for co college students, if the audience, that if, if, you, if you're an officer of fraternity today and, and you, don't, you don't do anything but something terrible happens at a party where someone gets alcohol poisoning, if you're the treasurer or the president and you had nothing to do with it, you didn't do the hazing, there are plaintiff's lawyers out here who are specialized in, in, in suing fraternities, and they'll come after you and your parents' homeowners' policies, which has actually been a way that, um, that has sparked a lot of change. So I think that's, that's kind of where we are today. So now we're going to transition to the part where we just get into the meat of your argument. And I, I hope this is useful for everyone. Um, I just want to so, – so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to provide like a, a very brief – low resolution summary of your argument as I see it. Okay. Um, and then you can, uh, first of all, if I'm leaving anything major out or getting anything major wrong, obviously say so. And then um, if not, if it's a reasonable summary, you could just maybe uh, elaborate. Sure. So the argument is uh, today fraternities do a lot of damage and do not live up to their espoused values. Your main critiques are that one, fraternities contribute to excessive drinking at college, leading to death in extreme cases like Tim Piazza at Penn State. Two, fraternities contribute to the objectification, sexual harassment, and sexual assault of women. Three, fraternities contribute to racism. And four, fraternities contribute to segregation by race, as well as class and political beliefs. In closing, you argue that since fraternities are here to stay, and that's something you acknowledge, uh, it is imperative that the aforementioned problems be addressed. A problem, though, is that at many colleges, fraternities have a lot of power vis-a-vis -vis administrations. This is, become, this is because tons of students want fraternities and because a lot of alumni donors are fraternity alums and highly supportive of fraternities. Thus, although fraternities, although fraternities might reform themselves, as Sigma Alpha Epsilon has done, for example, they also have the capacity to resist reform if they want to. I think that's uh, I think that's that's a reasonable summary. I mean, I I, I do um, I would also just point out that I I do point out some of their why fraternities are popular, which is mm -hmm. that um, they offer particularly at um, big public universities a a sort of co a, a place for people to belong in kind of an impersonal campus, and so. You know, people get lost in college, and I think a lot of the research that I looked at shows that people who belong to uh, fraternities and sororities often express um, a sort of more of an affinity to their college, um, feel that they have a sort of better social group, and that's a very powerful thing. I mean, just anecdotally, when I, you know, I met a lot of people in fraternities and sororities who said that, you know, they, they met their best friends, their, you know, it was the, 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 the people at their wedding and pallbearers at their funeral. They expect to be their fraternity brothers. And uh, so that is, Im that is an important factor, too, as well as the, sort of, as, as the philanthropy, you know, the $20 million a year that fraternities raise for um, charitable purposes. And um, so part of, part of my... I mean, part of my struggle and what I, I really struggle with in the book is, is how, can, how can that exist with some of these terrible things that happen? And also the other real issue is, is it possible that fraternities and, 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 um, are good for the people in them and are very helpful for career networking and success later in life, which there's a lot of evidence for that, but do they do some damage to the environment? that they're in. Hmm. I, I think that's a very useful corrective because I was basically summarizing your book as if it's all about the negative and you're saying it's not all about the negative. It's th there's also positive which you don't dismiss. Okay, F great. So um, maybe what we could do is just do a brief, slightly deeper dive into each of the four things sure. I mentioned like drinking, uh, sexism, racism, segregation and 
again, I'll kind of briefly summarize what I think you're arguing about each of those things, and then again, you can say that's accurate uh, and elaborate, or that's not entirely accurate. So sure. um, with regard to, so we'll start with drinking. Uh, so this is the <laughs> argument as far as I can tell. So on college campuses, fraternity members are twice as likely as other students to engage in binge drinking. This binge drinking tends to occur during pledging? Um, no, no, I mean, it, I oh, mean okay. no, I mean, the, the, the research is, is really pretty astonishing. It's, it's throughout oh, okay. fraternity membership itself, particularly living in a fraternity house, is associated with twice the level of binge drinking of the rest of the campus. Okay. Okay. So it's not a. It's not. It's not, not a pledging not, specific. No. I mean, yeah, the okay. pledging. A lot of the dangerous hazing. A lot of the deaths that we see. Okay, so the deaths are more. That's right. Poorly. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That's that's okay. So there's binge drinking throughout the year, but there's a higher likelihood of death due to drinking during pledging. That's right. Okay. So um. So on the subject of pledging, the vast majority of fraternity members go through pledging. That's right. Right. So the vast majority uh, go through pledging. Pledging, I think, in your view, is a polite word for hazing. I've heard you say that. It's like institutionalized hazing. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, that's what okay. And then, of course, <coughs> as part of pledging, uh, aspiring members who are relatively young and inexperienced and who don't know their own tolerance levels are pressured to drink massive amounts of hard liquor, not beer, which is less dangerous, uh, because if they don't, they won't get into the fraternity. They may be ostracized. They may feel emasculated. And some of them end up dying. Right. That's. I mean, that's that's definitely true. And I actually, since the book came out, I came out. Uh, up, I found another study that was fascinating because people were asking, well, what about later in life? And a study came out from the NIH, um, which found that. Let's see if I have this right. That almost half, half of men who live in fraternity houses, develop develop alcohol abuse disorder by the time they're 35, which is compared to a third of all college students, which to me is also kind of telling. Um, and it's the biggest association of any other group on campus. People who don't live in fraternity houses but are members also tend to drink more. And sorority membership is also associated, not quite as highly. Mm -hmm. but. Um, so, I mean, one of the, I mean, I, I'm going to anticipate some of your arguments. I mean, I think what I'm going to probably hear is, you know, drinking's a big problem on campus. We're blamed for it. Everybody does it, whatever. And there's some truth that there's a lot of drinking on campus, but the level of drinking at fraternities, it's really indisputably higher. It's the center of the drinking culture at any campus that has a serious, uh, serious Greek life. Okay, and, and we're, we are going to come back to some critiques, but right now we're just going to keep going through the argument. So uh, with regard to sexism and misogyny, so th here I think the argument is, again, fraternities contribute to the objectification, sexual harassment, and sexual assault of women, uh, largely by hosting parties characterized by intentionally high female-to-male -male ratios, sexually suggestive costume requirements for women, uh, and sometimes the use of date rape drugs, very importantly, including alcohol, which I think what you once described as like the most important well, date rape. Alcohol yeah. is by far the yeah. most common. Um, and also brothers might encourage each other to take advantage of women under the influence and joke about it and things like that. That's right. And um, I mean, again, there's also some, the, the Department of Justice studied <laughs> this and found that women who, uh, women who frequently go to uh, fraternity parties run one and a half times the risk of sexual assault, and sorority members um, run three times the risk of, in this case, in, of rape, and uh, presumably because they go to a lot of fraternity parties, which are often quite dangerous. So uh, it's more than just, you know, the occasional situation. Every, every piece of evidence that I looked at found, I looked at Indiana University and found some, you know, sort of non-public information. They have a huge Greek, Greek life there. and. You know, they had a disproportionate number of reports of sexual assault at fraternity houses. Um, it's it's not a that part is not a, a myth, as I think sometimes uh, fraternities like to put it. With regard to segregation, I think you mainly would focus on segregation by race. Yeah, I think that's I think that's okay. Fair. Right, and so you cite underrepresentation of racial minorities as a problem in fraternities. Uh, typically, the percentage of racial minorities in the wealthiest, most powerful fraternities is lower than that in the university population. Um, 
fraternities in effect, quote, promote segregation by race on campus. And then I think you've also suggested that fraternities promote, and this is a topic that's important for the Mill series, promote segregation by class and by political beliefs. That's right. And um, I mean, again, the nationally, if you look at, I mean, the book is really focused on on, on historically white fraternities, which are really sort of the, the, the biggest and most powerful fraternity, about 70 of them. And I think about 4% of members are, um, this is the best data I could find, are African American. And, you know, in, in big, big public universities that I, I visited, like the University of Alabama, um, a lot of these very, very wealthy fraternities that are sort of conduits to political and power and power in business have never had an African-American member. And part of the reason is, you know, the history of the fraternity um, uh, opposition to civil rights. And part of it is just sort of institutional barriers. Because I, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of the guys there who I have no doubt had had some interest in, you know, they had friends who they wanted to join. But what happens is that um, in a lot of these places, um, there's a focus on legacies. And so at the University of Alabama, you, you know, you'll have like a fourth generation SAE belong to the belong. And there's, it's very, very competitive to get in. And they recruit in high school. They recruit in their high school. They recruit in, in essentially a handful of, of wealthy um, public schools and private schools in Alabama that are largely white. So the pipeline, by the time someone gets to freshman year steps on campus, almost all the spaces are taken. And then you add to that that Rush is segregated, right? You have, you have the historically white fraternities, you have the historically black fraternities, Latino fraternities. Everyone is separated. So the chances of anyone kind of joining are very, very slim. And um, and the disproportionate resources are unbelievable. You have these like mansion houses that are subsidized by the University of Alabama, which, which, are, which are essentially all white. And the African-American fraternities don't have houses at all. Um, so right. it's hard to argue that doesn't, that doesn't contribute. Now, you can also argue there are clearly campuses that I've been to where the fraternities are much, much more diverse. They often reflect the culture of the school. Um, but overall, that's not the case. And, you know, there's most schools say that mixing people of diverse backgrounds and diverse viewpoints is part of the reason. You know, you're drawing people from all over the country to, to form a student body. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of schools, like at the beginning, they, they want to have roommates from different parts of the country, different backgrounds, different interests. But if the minute you walk on campus, you're divided like that, the chances of your having that kind of exchange mm. diminish. And, um, and the social science research sort of shows that it makes it less likely to have a friend from another race, another, an another social class. And I think that's, a, that's a, a serious issue. We're just going through the arguments. Finally, racism. Um, so uh, I, I think there are two major arguments about racism. The first is that we still see some episodes of like old school racism. Uh, inside fraternities, for example, the Oklahoma fraternity bus chant. Um, but then you also argue that fraternities contribute to institutional racism in student politics, uh, among other things, perhaps. So the argument about student politics is that uh, leading fraternities often act as powerful political machines, determining the outcome of elections for student government. And since racial minorities are underrepresented in leading fraternities, it's hard for members of racial minorities to win student elections unless they cultivate relationships with frater those fraternities. That's right. And um, again, I go back to the University of Alabama, which was a sort of a subject of a chapter. You literally had something <coughs> that was known as the machine, which was a, a, a group of the old row fraternities that would get together and decide how sort of stu student life was run. They would run their slate of, of candidates. And for generations, only their candidates would win. And the student presidents would always be white. And when I was there, they had the first black student president, who's an amazing guy, who had friends in the fraternity system, was not a member. But he was the first in, like, I think it was 40 or 50 years. And, you know, he really had to, 
I mean, it was an extraordinary case. And I think afterwards, uh, a machine person did, did win. Order so was restored. Yeah, so, and, and that, that may be an extreme <coughs> example, but I saw it like University of Texas, there's been, the student paper was looking at just the disproportionate number of people in fraternities who, who go on to student government. Now, I should say that, you know, being in a fraternity is leadership experience, so it makes sense that if you join a fraternity and you're president of your fraternity, you'll learn how to be a leader, and you also cultivate a good base of political support in your fraternity and other ones. But I think that makes it even more important that the fraternities be open to everybody, so everyone has that kind of, you know, possibility. You have made clear that uh, fraternities cannot be abolished. That's just a fact. Like, even if someone wanted to abolish fraternities, they're not going to be abolished. They're far too powerful. Um, but, but suppose, very hypothetically, that I waved a magic wand and abolished fraternities so that tomorrow we woke up to find that all fraternities in the U.S. had lost their legal existence, liquidated their assets, and left hundreds of thousands of male collegians with no fraternity and no possibility of a fraternity in the future. On balance, taking all of the positive and negative consequences that would flow from that into account, do you think the U.S. would be better or worse off? Well, I think the way I like to think about it is that if, if we were to start a, universe, a, a, a higher education system <coughs> from scratch, would, would you want, would, would any college president say, here's an idea, let's, let's bring in a diverse group of people, and from sort of day one, let's divide them by male, female, socioeconomic, and race, and give vastly different resources to different groups. No one would ever propose that. I mean, it's just, it would be a non-starter. So, but I don't actually, I, as a, again, as a, as a journalist, I, I look at the world as it is, and it's not the only, I mean, you also wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't probably create our housing patterns the way they are. There are many parts of society that are, that are not um, ideal. Right. Um, so to me, the question is. The New York subway. There you go, there you go, <laughs> that's true. So, so my, my question then is, is, is what, what do you do? And I, on the abolition question, it's not impossible. I mean, there have been schools that have successfully abolished fraternities. Um, and, and actually, the, the ones that have successfully done it are, are ones like, like Lafayette. So, and in, in the book, I talk a lot about Williams, which in the 1950s and 60s decided that it was not a serious enough place, that the party scene was out of control, that they weren't getting the students that they wanted. And the president of Williams went on this, like, multi-decade or I think push to try to offer an alternative to fraternities and he actually belonged to fraternity. I've noticed that a lot of the sort of presidents who are pushing really hard belong to fraternities and um, everyone told him it would destroy Williams that uh, no one would donate and and you know it turns out Williams is now the wealthiest uh, liberal arts college in the country and you know it's 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 doing fine, and a lot of its competitors, like Amherst and <coughs> Middlebury and Bowdoin, did the same thing. Um, but the real difference is that that happened in the 1960s, when fraternities were very unpopular. There just wasn't the same kind of support. I think it would be extremely difficult to do today. I I know that there have been there have been cases where it has happened, and just in terms of the legality of it, um, a private university like Williams. They, they actually can do it. Um, they actually have a ban on belong. If you, if, you, if you look on their website, if you belong to a Greek organization, you will be expelled. It's a pretty harsh sanction. Um, it's much less clear whether a public university, which is a government organization, could, could sort of forbid you to associate with a group. So that's, that's one issue. But there's still big you know, free speech issues. And you know, schools like Harvard are, are trying to basically punish people who belong to fraternities and, and eating clubs. They're, they're saying that if you belong to one, we won't recognize you, um, we won't nominate you for a Rhodes Scholarship, and you can't be captain of a team. And there's a lot of debate over that. A lot of debate from all sides of the political spectrum. I mean, it's a, it's a tough issue. We're going to open it up for Q&A uh, soon, but first I'm going to put forward a few um, critiques. I think a lot of people do view this as you know, for being very simplistic about it, like a, an anti-fraternity book. Well, it's so yeah. interesting because um, I should say that people who have actually like read the book, who belong to fraternities, are often 
don't see it that way. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of there's there's definitely like a lot of hostility toward it. But I mean, one of the uh, I mean, after this book came out, I was wondering, you know, what would what would people in it, what would the leadership of SAE think of it? And they were very receptive after the book as well, which um, you know a lot of people saw it as pretty pretty tough, but. You know, I gave a talk like this, and the, and the president of um, the, the most recent president of SAE attended, and he stood up and he said, "You know, uh, I didn't like what I read in a lot of this thing, but but it was true, and we have this problem. We need to address it." So, I think it kind of depends where you come from. If uh, I think the people who really are trying are, are not just thinking of their own fraternity experience, but thinking about sort of the movement as a whole, or the people who aren't just in a fraternity for four years in college, but are trying to make sure that it lasts for another generation, I think they actually might have a, a different view. Well, a lot of the people I talked to in preparation for this event, they're alums. You know, they went to college 40 or 50 years ago, uh, so they have that perspective. Um, I have, I think, like four critiques, mm -hmm. uh, and three of them are almost verbatim, or two of them are almost verbatim from those individuals. Um, I'm going to start with the, the most combative critique, um, and I've been a little unsure as to whether I should uh, present this critique, but I think it probably represents the way some people feel deep down privately when they hear arguments um, like yours, or at least arguments like yours as characterized by others. So this is the only critique that's kind of long. I think it's going to take me like 90 seconds to say. It's really just like an editorial. And then I just okay. you know, can respond to it. Okay, All so. Right. And, and this, this is really for me. I'm just going to put my cards on the table. So uh, there's something I see a lot of that really frustrates me, and it's this. Uh, we take for granted institutions that were hard to build, that took creativity, intelligence, discipline, and long-term thinking and execution to build, that bring a lot of benefits to people. Amazon, for example. Amazon provides untold value to many tens of millions of people. But PBS's recent documentary on Amazon focuses overwhelmingly not on the benefits delivered by Amazon, but on the costs, the businesses that have failed or become subservient to Amazon, the workers who don't like the work environment. Frankly, the documentary features a lot of people who likely have little track record of building anything, who focus their energy on the costs of Amazon's growth seemingly ignoring or at least de-emphasizing the benefits of its growth and trying to regulate Amazon in all kinds of ways without stopping to marvel and express gratitude and make clear that overall we should be deeply grateful to Jeff Bezos and his company. Fraternities to me are another obviously very different example of institutions that create a lot of value and that have been built and sustained by private individuals and groups with passion and vision and initiative. Fraternities did not fall out of the sky. They were created and sustained by leaders to foster camaraderie, socialization, lifelong friendship, career networking, and importantly, character development. Fraternities do all those things, and they help to sustain colleges financially, as fraternity members are much more generous to their alma maters than are their fellow alums. At the risk of seeming a bit combative, I see your argument somewhat similarly to the way I saw the PBS documentary about Amazon. It's not that you completely ignore or flatly deny the benefits of fraternities, but you don't focus on them. Instead, you focus on the things that go wrong at fraternities. And arguably, in some of your arguments about racism and sexism at fraternities, you overstate these wrongs in a typical and fairly trendy way. At the same time, you don't show or even try to show, as far as I can tell, that the world on balance would be better off without fraternities. So in short, my worry is that this attitude, this orientation of taking our institutions for granted even though they weren't easy to build on fo and focusing on the things that are wrong with them, uh, it's doing harm to the US, not helping it. Critics think that they're holding powerful institutions to account, but they're actually demonstrating a mentality that undervalues entrepreneurship and institution building, and as strange as it may sound, exaggerates and overstates the importance of the harm done by entrepreneurs and institution builders. Hmm. Um. Well, it's it's hard to sort of defend um, a, a sort of how uh, my book's character is rather than what it actually says. So that's, yeah. that's the first thing I should say. Fair and, enough. And also, yeah. um, it's a little. I'm just trying to think about your your, your Amazon. I mean, I'm. I, I'll put that aside for a minute. In that, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm I'm a journalist and and and. An investigative reporter, so I tend to try to look 
deeply and very hard at organizations and try to hold them to account. And I think that's a, an extremely important role in society. And so I, I, in, you know, I, I think that most, um, and your Amazon, Amazon is a, an extremely important company. It's exactly the kind of organization that journalists need to examine carefully. And, um, you know, it's really fascinating you bring up Amazon. So Amazon, you know, is owned by Jeff Bezos. Um, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, which is a very aggressive organization that does exactly the kind of exposés that you're talking about, and very successfully, even has um, exposed some very, um, you know, damaging personal information about Bezos. And Bezos has basically said that he's keeping his hands off because it's so important that the fourth estate be independent and skeptical and to hold powerful organizations to account. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you can always, you can always, um, you can always argue about sort of emphasis, but I mean, uh, you know, all I can say is I spent, you know, a couple of years looking at the evidence and talking to enormous numbers of people, looking, you know, at the fraternity's own archives and files, and talking to the guys themselves, talking to the leaders. And what I say in the book reflects, uh, you know, I think my best accounting of the evidence. And also, there's not really much of an argument for people who really know fraternities. And I, I would just say that, mm. You know, maybe, maybe, there's hostility maybe from undergraduates who feel like, well, I didn't describe my, you know, it's not like my fraternity. But, you know, we're talking about large organizations that have huge problems. I mean, you know, I, and I look at this pretty rigorously as a business journalist. I mean, the insurance industry is, a, is, is keeping track of all the episodes. And, um, you know, I think 15% of all claims against uh, fraternities involve sexual assault, which is like, the, the second largest category after assault and battery. And the insurance rates are very, very high. And most, most there's only like four insurance companies that will even take the risk. Um, this is not like anecdote. This is actual, these are actual problems. And I think that it's really important. And also I'd sort of flip it around because I actually think that, you know, I think sometimes fraternities see themselves as sort of an, an, an aggrieved sort of subculture, you know, where the, the, the administration is against them or whatever. But I, I, the book, I looked at sort of the marketing of colleges. And I mean, look at Lafayette's own website, um, Office of Greek Life. It's, it's a full-throated endorsement of Greek life as something that builds character and helps with scholarship and, you know, is a, these are premier leadership organizations. There's no mention of any of the public health data that I'm talking about, about the risks of drinking. There's no, and the disciplinary, you click a little, click a little space and you look at the disciplinary history and you'll see that like, you know, this one was shut down, but there's no explanation about why. And in the book, I, when I could, I find out why. You know, I, I ask the public universities, uh, do public records requests, and I get hundreds of pages of documents. And some of the behavior was just horrendous. I think that, you know, particularly as an organization that's talking about like free flow of information, what I'm calling for in the book is accurate information. To put in, like, I, I would like to see accurate public health information on these websites so you can balance when you're joining. A family can say, yes, it's going to help my career, but my child might be at risk. Let's have a talk about it. Um, and um, this has been something that Penn State is actually doing that after the horrific death of Timothy Piazza. They're, doing report cards that have much more detailed information. But a lot of it, if you look at it, it, it just doesn't say. There's no way that a family can really judge from what most universities put on their website. What, what universities do, and this is, I think, if you're in <coughs> Greek life, this is something also that you should be concerned about, is that on, their web, on the websites, Greek life is used as a huge selling point, a marketing tool. People really want, I, and I, I do not begrudge the popularity, so, so, you know, they promote all the things that you say in this charitable uh, um, groups. But then when something bad happens, which almost inevitably does year after year, I mean, every year someone dies at a fraternity. This last couple of years, five, five people have died. 
It's not even like a record. Um, then the university say, well, you know, it wasn't us, and you know, we kicked them off campus, and then they go on promoting it. And so, you know, there is some degree which universities are looking the other way, and kind of they're kind of shunting the risk onto fraternities to provide all this liquor, and then they're kind of not taking responsibility. So I would actually argue that in at a lot of schools, you know, I think maybe it depends on the university. Fraternities are are actually not really like an aggrieved subculture, they're extremely powerful. And that university presidents often feel like that they can't take organizations on, they'll lose donations. Um, in the book, I, I, I look deeply at, um, at one, one case at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington because I wanted to see how the dynamic worked. And this was a case where, where three students one fall had been hospitalized with alcohol poisoning, which means they almost died. At, at an SAE chapter, and the dean was, was, I think, rightly concerned and could not sort of prove the case because there was no cooperation, but finally got really compelling evidence, um, uh, a signed confession from one of, the, one of the pledges to having participated in a hazing operation, underage drinking, and um, also um, emails showing that, um, that members had tried to obstruct the the uh, the investigation and told other members to lie, and also a, a 17 minute dash cam video from the police department, which showed up at a pledge event where all these uh, these um, underage pledges were 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 drunk, and one of them was so drunk that he walked up to the to the uh, cruiser and mistook it for a taxi that was taking him home and then like went outside and, and, and threw up in, in the bushes. So it was like this was really, really compelling evidence. And what happened next was really, to me, I think really instructive. The, the, there was a long hearing where the fraternity hired a politically connected lawyer um, who actually set budgets for University of North Carolina. The university still decided they were going to shut, shut the chapter down. Um, but the fraternity decided that that, that wasn't acceptable. The, the national fraternity actually wanted to shut it down, but the local, the local alumni, including big donors to, to, um, to politicians and also to the university, got three new trustees on the board. And one of them told me that the only reason he was joining the board of trustees was to get SAE back on, cha on, on campus. And that he actually called the chancellor of the university and said, you're going to do this one way or another, you can do it the easy way or the hard way. Basically threatened the chancellor if he didn't do it. And I, I confirmed both, both sides of this conversation <laughs> that this happened. And long story short, after a few years, SAE was back and the chancellor lost his job. So it was, you know, I think it kind of shows that um, there is some pretty significant power and, and that it's, I think, behooves fraternities themselves not to necessarily resist when when both the national organizations and colleges are actually trying to keep, keep students safe. So uh, these are two brief perspectives from some Lafayette alums who are also fraternity alums. I think it's important to articulate their point of view sure. that's out there. OK, so um, here's one perspective. Uh, many of the problems you identify in the book, dangerous levels of binge drinking, racism, sexual harassment, and assault are extremely exceptional, not normal. The perpetrators are rogue members or bad apples. I, I watched the video at Oklahoma or, or Arkansas, and I, th I think you're uh, bad apple. Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. He, he said bad apples like eight times in one sentence. Uh, so um, this may seem like an unimaginative, unconvincing response to your work, but my sense is that it's a very important response because I've talked to a lot of fraternity members and supporters over the last several days, and time and time again, they say some version of the following to me. All of the horrible stuff he describes, I either never saw it or almost never saw it. On the contrary, I had an amazing experience. Um, an experience I wouldn't trade for anything. Uh, of course bad stuff happens. It's a big country, 400,000 people in fraternities across America. And uh, young men do stupid things sometimes. Uh, and less frequently, they do really, really stupid things. Um, but the horrible incidents that, re that receive disproportionate attention in the media and in your book are again extremely exceptional, not the rule. Uh, and finally, these individuals also agree that fraternities are responsible for filtering out, suspending, or expelling toxic, dangerous members. 
So. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard all those arguments. And, you know, well, I have, again, I, I should say that I had great respect for many of the fraternity members that I met. And I have no doubt that these are meaningful, meaningful experiences. And I have a chapter in the book about, you know, uh, a fraternity chapter advisor who, and, and his chapter who just totally turned around this chapter. And it was so incredibly meaningful. I mean, the, the guy sort of, he was actually, um, you know, had a terminal disease and they all rallied around and sort of to help him. And I mean, it was, it was really moving and it's not something that I discount. I mean, this is like, you know, age of social media. These are real human connections that people are looking for. But that said, I mean, it's, you know, this is the, I, I guess it's the argument of, you know, that these are, these are, um, these are on, on anomalies. But that totally ignores the research. I mean, if, if, if every single study has shown that the dangerous drinking of fraternities is twice everyone else's, then it's fair to hold them account for not just the deaths, but, you know, I looked at alcohol poisoning transports from fraternities. I mean, there's just a lot of bad stuff happening. It's amazing there isn't more, you know, more of these problems. Um, and again, with sexual assault, I mean, the, the research is, is pretty clear. It could have more to do with the drinking environment, or it could be something to do with, um, with attitudes. But um, it is, you know, and again, the insurance information. I, I don't think that you can just argue it away. Argue it away. I mean, I, I find it, a, one thing that, one of the arguments I hear a lot is, well, you know, how come, how come, um, you know, you're blaming us for this. Why are we being held to the standard? And the, you know, what I always say is, I am actually taking fraternities seriously. Fraternities are talking about being true gentlemen and sort of answering to sort of a higher character, a higher code of conduct. So I usually, when someone tells me like, well, you know, that football player did something awful. I'm like, well, why are you, why are you, if you're leaders, why are you comparing yourself to the football team and not to, you know, I don't know, the student government, you know, or uh, there, there are many organizations that don't, for instance, brutally haze and occasionally kill their members. I mean, it's just, you know, there and are. so, yeah. And um, <laughs> like hazing, for example, um, fraternities did their own study of, they, 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 they hired a, a respected researcher and funded the study and found that 75% of, of fraternity members said they've been hazed. 75%. So it's, it's not the exception. It's the rule. That's why I'm pretty confident saying that pledging is essentially institutionalized hazing. It's sort of a matter of degree. And, and we're not talking about, you know, people say, oh, hazing, you're talking about all wearing the same outfits. The most common form of hazing is asking someone to drink so much that they lose consciousness. And that is the hazing that killed Tim Timothy Piazza. So, well, and, and one Lafayette yeah. alum I talked to said that he thinks there should be no drinking involved with pledging. Right. No, I mean, I, th I think, that's, I think that's, um, that's really important. So I, again, I, don't, I just don't find that convincing. And you know, I think, I think it's actually in the fraternity's own interest to change this. I don't really understand why all of this is necessary for creating the bonds that they're all talking about. And I think a lot of, a lot of fraternity members probably feel the same way. So here's another from a Lafayette alum. Uh, <coughs> it's almost verbatim. Uh, okay. Standards and expectations for college students should be the same as those for the general public. Anyone who has committed sexual assault pressured another person to harm himself, committed gross, act, gross acts of negligence, disturbed the peace, been publicly intoxicated, have committed crimes. Any victims have recourse to the police and or the justice system. Many fraternity alums and some scholars like Camille Paglia, um, Casey Johnson, argue that colleges have no business adjudicating drinking and sexual assault offenses. Police and the courts should handle these issues, not colleges. College staff may not always have much relevant experience and training. They may presume guilt, violate due process. They may hold groups responsible for the actions of individual members. Um, and this last point, holding fraternities responsible for the actions of individual members is something that multiple alums complained about. Right, so that, what's your perspective? I mean, that's, I think that's a really interesting question. I, you know, <laughs> I think it's a very complicated argument on there. I mean, I, I think, um, I think the, 
this is somewhat beyond the scope of my book, but the police do not have a really excellent um, track record of investigating sexual assault either. And colleges are actually required under Title IX to do something about it. So they're not really, it's not really a choice. Um, and um, so that is, again, just kind of the way it is. Um, and clearly, you know, due process is important, and there have been cases where, you know, due process wasn't followed. I have cases in the book, though, where, you know, where it was pretty clear that, that there, was, there were fraternity members who were actively obstructing police in inquiries. And that, that's disturbing, you know. So on the group, the group issue, um, here's, the, here's the way I see it. Again, I'll go back to this. Um, if you're going to hold yourself to a higher standard, hold yourself to a higher standard. If you're, you, you can't say that you're, again, true gentleman, and then say, oh, well, this person, you know, brutally beat this uh, person or, you know, now, now suddenly he's no longer part of the organization and we shouldn't be judged by that. You know, you're, usually their own, their own creeds say that, that, that they're, they're brothers keepers. So I, I feel like that's, that's important. The other thing I, I would say is um, I, I'm viewing this, part of the reason I don't uh, pr promote abolition is I think that this should be viewed as a public health issue. And when you have a public health issue, what you do um, is you, you try to address the environment. And you know, the best uh, example is, is, is smoking. Smoking became more expensive, more highly regulated, more difficult to find, highly taxed. And people said it would never work, but smoking rates are way down. And so if, if you're worried about problem drinking, and you, if you have a fraternity that is creating a dangerous environment where you know, week after week, people are being carted off to the hospital for alcohol poisoning, where people are, un where there's underage drinking, where sexual assaults occur, and you know, then fraternities will say, well, it wasn't one of our members. It was just someone who came to our party. Well, you know, you hosted the party. So if you were running a bar, which is essentially, in some cases, what's happening, and you had a bar that week after week reported sexual assaults or served underage liquor, the police would shut you down. And so, if, if it can't be done responsibly, then you, you will be hold, held accountable. And so one of the solutions that some fraternities like Phi Delta Theta, which I talk about in the book, decided to, to just not allow alcohol in the chapter houses. You know, and it's, it's not always enforced, but their experience is there's a lot less alcohol in those chapter houses, and their rate of incidents, accidents, deaths, their insurance rates went down like 90%. So, I mean, I don't necessarily think, I, I don't think that um, clearly, if, it's, if you're talking about a criminal case, the, person sh the, the individuals have to be held criminally liable. But if you, you're creating a dangerous space, you're not, it's not like people um, are being sent to jail or being expelled. Some, it's often just a matter of like literally shutting down a house where people are getting hurt. I think that that's something that actually the fraternities should uh, embrace. And then that will lead to change. And finally, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, question, is there much evidence that fraternities exclude racial minorities? That is, are black students trying, are black students, for example, trying and failing to get into the powerful, prestigious, predominantly white fraternities? Or are groups just kind of sorting themselves? Um, it's sort of, historically, it's absolutely true. I mean, one of the... <coughs> You know, I, I, in the book I looked at the civil rights period, which is, it's a, it's a very ugly history of fraternities, you know, going back to like the 1950s, most fraternities had explicit laws that, I'm talking about historically white fraternities, had explicit laws that prohibited Jews and blacks. They, a lot of them had cl clauses which said only Aryans, you know, this is after World War II, could belong. SE had, had that and uh -huh. others too. And when they were challenged, um, I, I found like a, a long record of a, a debate that had never been made public before about this. Schools were, like, were basically saying, um, we're going to shut you down because this is illegal. Fraternities, what they did was they um, decided to strike the Aryan clauses, but create language that said the same thing. So, and so for years, it was understood. It was kind of an unwritten rule. And there was something, um, I don't know if, they, if it's still around, called the, the, the black ball, which is any one member can reject any, any recruit. 
And that was a way that was used often mm. to keep out, and it was secret, <coughs> to keep out uh, African Americans. Now, I mean, fast forward to today, I, I don't, it's, it's very hard to tell. I mean, there was a case just in 2015 where in, at the University of Alabama, this was sororities, Sorority, the, the, the traditional white sororities had never had an African-American mm -hmm. student. Mm -hmm. And finally, a number of sorority women decided that they, they were going to pledge um, several women. And their, count, their chapter advisors told them, no, you can't let any African-Americans in. And this, is, this was 2015. And this became public, and it became such an outcry that the, the president, the, the for, former presidents had basically, this had been an issue for years, had basically said, look, we just want all the people associated with them. They, he, she finally said, this is, we can't have this. It was a national story. And so finally, these organizations were integrated uh, through, I think, some really brave behavior by the sororities themselves. Um, but when I, when I this, years later, when I looked at, I got records of the fraternities, there were many of them that still hadn't had any. So I don't, I don't know for sure. A lot of them, I, you know, I talked to um, some, some, you know, men at uh, the predominantly white fraternity, SAE and Kappa Alpha, and they were telling me they, they were trying. Right. They were trying to so there's recruit. There's not much demand. Well, no, or, they would. They would or, or so. Well, if, there is, a, there, there are a couple issues. One is um, it's, it's a small-ish small pipeline. The other is because fraternities have this history, yeah. There's a whole network of African American fraternities, and those were formed because African Americans weren't welcomed in white fraternities, and and during the civil rights movement, these organizations were on the sort of right side of history, and so people are proud to join them, and and so it's actually particularly hard, um, but that again, and that is often an argument. Well, you know, people voluntarily do this, but that's a history. That's that's from the history of, of segregation.